Hello everybody and welcome here inside the Hoxon Chapel, that's the old 15th, 16th century chapel that you have been seeing me sitting in front of lately a lot, making videos for you. Now we are inside for the next episode, the seventh in the CPE Bach in series. So in case this title, the title of this video gave you a little bit of a shock, harpsichord not for solo music, remember this, this is just a follow-up video of last episode, episode number six, in which we talked about, we started in fact to talk about the preface of Emanuel Bach's Versuch über die wahre Art als Klavier zu spielen, the treatise uh, on the true art of keyboard playing. Reading that together with you in bits and pieces, that's what this series is about. And we stopped actually with the first word of the preface, or about the first word, which was keyboard on itself, clavier. What does Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach meant by that? So, luckily for us, Bach was not only a master keyboard player, a master composer, but he had also a university degree. So he was able in the 18th century to express his thoughts really in a way that he wanted them to fit on paper. And so Emmanuel is really clear about what he describes as being the definition of the term clavier. In his words, the term clavier, in his, in his opinion, the term clavier is the um, general name indicating all kinds of keyboards instruments. So that's important to remember. And he actually finds two main uh, types of keyboard instruments, which is at the one hand the clavichord, at the other hand the harpsichord. So, so far this aligns rather well with how we define today still, generally speaking, the term keyboard. Which is really interesting because it is a highly debated word and by reading CPE Bach it doesn't say much about the word or the term clavier in other contexts, but that's of course something for future research. For Immanuel Bach, this is very clear. So the alignment with how we interpret that today would be that keyboard music in general can be played on all types of keyboards. That's our modern today's approach. But is that exactly how Immanuel describes this? Contrary to our belief of today in the early music movement that you can play all keyboard music, all kinds of keyboard music on all types of keyboards, Bach seemed to correct us. He namely is very specific in attaching a kind of practical use to a certain instrument. Namely, he says that for solo music, most often the clavichord is used and for orchestral music, the harpsichord is used. We today, and I'm speaking really in general now, have a kind of understanding, accepted understanding that the clavichord was a kind of cheap instrument for study purposes, which was perfect for the ordinary musician that could not afford a more expensive instrument as a harpsichord was. But that's not what Immanuel Bach writes, and maybe that's also not a correct image of the 18th century clavichord. Bach writes solo music, clavichord, orchestral music, harpsichord. So, how does that fit with our practice today? His definition leaves a little bit of room for exchange, so to say, but how much is hard to say. On the clavichord, Bach gives a a kind of uh, additional uh, describing uh, description in the way that he says that the clavichord, some people like the clavichord, prefer the clavichord also as an accompaniment instrument, even above a pianoforte. But he does not give the same room in the preface of his book to the harpsichord, which is in fact conflicting with our today's understanding since looking to the concerts and to the recordings, most solo music, German music, that's what we're talking about here, is played on a harpsichord and not on a clavichord. Saying that the, this definition was only valid in early 50 years, as the book was published in 1753, the first volume, as some recent studies seem to believe, is not true because Bach had a new edition, prepared also a new edition with Benjamin Schrickert, that's the publisher who bought the rights for his book in 1787. So in the 
in the, in the uh, course towards 1787, Bach had a complete revision of his book. And actually, we have letters from him saying that he has revisited his book and there is nothing there to add. He still stands behind what he has said so many years before. So we can say that this opinion, this definition, was something that Bach carried along his whole career. So from that perspective, this quote alone, that differs a lot from our today's use, today's practice, where we have a lot of solo recording of solo music, German music, on harpsichords, and much more than on clavichord. It's even not comparable. Of course, I'm in a kind of bad position to advocate this, this, this thing for the, about the clavichord, since I'm a really passionate clavichord player. I love my instrument, I like the dynamics of it, I like the expressive cap capacities of it. And I, I would understand if you are a dedicated harpsichord player that your blood pressure would go up a little bit. But, and of course I believe in that, that, that clavichord case, but it's not what, about what we believe in or not believe in, it's a fact, it's what, uh, what Emanuel Bach wrote about it. It's his, his, his idea, it is his opinion. If he were to give a lecture tonight about the term keyboard and how to use different keyboards in different situations, he probably would say the same. And in fact, we have the sources and the witnesses that we have where he played music for those persons was on clavichords. So that all fits into that context. That leaves us with a few questions. For instance, does that definition apply also for the music of Father Bach? How come that we today are playing so much more harpsichord with German music than clavichord? And how come that today, with sources so easily accessible as through Google and the Internet, are not taking those facts more seriously? and continue with our practice as we are used to be, to do or are teached by the previous generation players. That's interesting. And it's of course not up to me to answer those questions. I would love to read your thoughts about this. And again, it's not, it's not about being provocative or controversial. I know this is something that we did. I said it at the beginning of the video. This does not reflect our today's practice, but that should not halt us from thinking about it. If I would give two elements to clarify this a bit, or to give my, uh, under, my understanding on how we come today in such a, uh, in the position where we have more harpsichord recordings and clavichord recordings considered to German music, is probably because of the quality of the clavichords as it was in the 18th century, also very rare to find an excellent clavichord, it is still today. We have several good builders, we have excellent instruments, but compared to a harpsichord, they are very difficult to make. Probably the clavichord is the most difficult instrument to build since you don't have any margin as a builder to deviate from what is perfect, because if you deviate one inch one centimeter or one percent, you deliver in on sound, you deliver in on capacities, you deliver in on dynamic range. And there are an excellent clavichord, I cannot repeat it, it's very hard to get. It's very expensive as well as it was in the 18th century. The excellent clavichords were very much sought after and were very expensive, even going into the 19th century with Mendelssohn buying 18th century clavichords. Mozart wanted to have the Silberman, um, but he was, it, it, it was not sold to him. So clavichords was kind of big business, even after the period of the, the, the great builders. So today, to combine with the second element that when the generation that we call the pioneers, let's say the Gustav Leonard generation, started to play on period instruments. By the standards of building of those days, the, you can imagine that the clavichord as an instrument on stage in a time where even the period instruments as a whole was discussed and maybe laughed with by many, many uh, musicians and by the public. They had to find an instrument that gave them a kind of confidence that they could put on a stage. And in that early days of instrument building, 
the harpsichord was maybe the more easy instrument to build, and so it might may not surprise us that the generation of Leonard, the early Joseph van Dimensiel, I mean, the whole early music movement, both people, by the way, were, were clavichord players as well, but that they went on the train of the harpsichord and they created, and certainly Leonard created, really harpsichord schools and leaving perhaps the idea or the reflection of looking back to the original sources and giving the clavichord more of a chance. I think today the biggest, I would say, challenge in keyboard music is to um, make more builders of high quality aware and invest in clavichord building. It is not easy. I see it with Joris Spotflieg, I see it with other, other builders. It, it is a lifetime of dedication to come to an instrument where you really can play the Bach partitas on, where you really can play a Beethoven sonata on, because that should be possible on a good clavichord. So that takes a lot of time, and you cannot assume that a clavichord is being built just as a kind of uh, in between between pianoforte and harpsichord building. That's another niche. That's another. Uh, I, I do believe that there are many good harpsichord builders who could potentially be excellent clavichord builders if they would have a market of players that would demand them, that would ask them to build such instruments. And I think that's what we need in the future. Not because I like the clavichord, but that's what this hip thing is about, is historically informed performance practice. And I'm only looking now to that one source of CPE Bach. I'm aware of that, but Hey, that's an important source. Clavichord, solo music, harpsichord, orchestral music. So, that's all I wanted to say about this. I know it sounds maybe controversial. Don't take it as that. Just see it as one building stone in this interesting, fascinating journey of discoveries that we actually constantly making. What, kind, what a privilege is that, um, that we live in a time where we can do that, where we can share that with you. Okay, that was it for this episode of CPE Bach, number seven, up to the next one. If this is your first time here on Authentic Sound, love to have you subscribe. We're making videos on Bach to Beethoven, sharing the beauty of the, that music with you. And the word discover is actually in the center of everything, diving into all kinds of contexts and perspectives that hopefully we come up with some elements that you as a musician can take as a source of inspiration. That really would make my day. So thanks for watching, sharing this video with your friends. Don't forget that. Give it also a thumbs up since that's really important for the YouTube algorithms, so to say. And certainly don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. And then we see each other very soon again. Bye.